So the recruiter asked me to straighten my hair for my second interview with them. As you can see from, my hair is basically dead straight. And that wasn't enough. So I understood that the undertone was, we just don't like her, ethnically her. There's stuff about her that bothers us. But I was so need for a job that I didn't care. But I remember that morning straightening my hair, which I hate the smell to begin with. It's something I avoid. Just like feeling choked up and being like, this sucks. And then like brushing those thoughts away and being like, but I have to do this. I can't be late and this matters and I need this job. And what is it? And even if this isn't it, I have to show the recruiter I'm trying. I don't want this job at this point, but I have to show the recruiter I'm trying. So I have to comply because they're going to give her feedback. But I remember praying the whole time, like, I don't want to get this. I just don't want to burn a bridge with this recruiter. But if this is how they see me, they have a problem with my pants, they have a problem with my hair, and the whole staff is white, I know the problem isn't with how I'm presenting myself. The problem is something I can't control. Dímelo, dímelo, mi gente. What's good? Welcome to another episode of the Quintueras Podcast brought to you by Plural. As a quick reminder, on this podcast, the mission is to redefine professionalism. So every week we have a different guest join us for a very candid conversation around their experience between professionalism and authenticity. The goal is to give you the right representation to help you feel empowered, inspired, to start finally being your most authentic self, regardless of where you are. Speaking of guests, on this week's episode, we are joined by well actually i can't reveal the name of this week's guest and i know what you're thinking well every week you have a face and a name to each guest and i've always been intentional about doing that because a lot of the research and, and studies and publications around the workplace experience of people of color, of the Latino community, of the black community, of so many of these marginalized communities, the stories are often told anonymously. So when I decided to put a face and name to each story, I aim to change that, to show people that they can talk about these experiences publicly in spite of that fear. That said, I know that not everyone is going to be comfortable with that idea, especially depending on what industry you're in, how niche it is, and how easily you can be pointed out because you are probably the only person of color in the entire building. It becomes a little scarier when the things you're talking about go into some of that resistance and retaliation. These are difficult situations to talk about. So we should respect and admire the people that talk about them publicly, as well as those that talk about them anonymously. Either way, they are helping us educate and advocate for these workplace experiences. So listen to this episode with the same intention, but maybe a different side of empathy and understanding as to why this person may not want to be public. So we're going to call this person Fulana as a nod to our first anonymous episode that was titled Guerrero Anonimo. As you would imagine, because this person wants to remain anonymous, there will be no video recording published of this conversation. That said, let's get into this dope audio conversation with this week's guest. My butt would have gone up and moved to any other office that meant having people who were more human. I felt like if you weren't a consultant, that human aspect wasn't there. And because there is one thing that lacks in this place is humanity and people. Like you see people deprioritize their families. You just, people don't, and maybe like I'm expecting people to care about their families to talk about real stuff, not just what they did at the country club and what new search they want. And like, just... I don't know, sound human, not sound so transactional when they talk about their families. And I wish I would have known sooner that I was in the wrong office. But when it came to the New York office, and this is what I said to him this morning, like to that friend, I was like, you did nothing wrong. You're just sadly in an office where everyone's so classist. And like, it feels like you're in high school. Like I remember every time I'd go down to the cafeteria, which I intentionally avoided eating there, even though I was told I should try harder, like befriend people or be seen or whatever. People sit according to their role. 
you will never see a consultant sitting with their coordinator unless it's because they took them out to lunch because it's their birth. And even then that won't be in the office because optics, right? That will be outside of the office where they might do nice things, but you'll never see them sitting there with people who can't eventually get promoted into their role with people who don't serve their purpose. Wow. Did you notice those things immediately when you, when you started working there? It took a bit, if I'm honest. I think I was so relieved and so traumatized from my interviewing experiences at other places that I was so happy to see diversity that it took me a minute to, I think, maybe want to see it. Tell me about those traumatic interview experiences. And how early on was this in your career? Oh my God, this is out of college. I had been looking for work in a different sector and it just wasn't happening. And student loans, especially when that's not the only way you can really get through college, they were not waiting for nobody. So as depressed as I was that nothing was working out and college was a whole journey for me, that different conversation, but pointed in my head, I was like, okay, I worked way too hard. I'd put myself through so much. Like, even though this is not what I want, I'm going to get up and get a job I don't want because I can't die in debt at this point. And so a friend put me in touch with a recruiter that she knew on the admin side. And I was like, oh my God, I did this in college. The last thing I want to do is this, right? Like the whole point is to go to college to get a quote unquote better job or you're not supporting someone. You're not someone for lack of a better word. I, I hate this word, but it's like minion, right? Like the whole point is like to be your own boss one day at some degree. And I went on a lot of admin interviews. And at this point, this was my last shot, right? Like I needed to get a job. So I was willing to do anything and everything. And this recruiter was one of the few that had answered. And I liked her. She was great. She seemed like she knew what she was doing. They put me with three different recruiters at their company, sending me out to jobs and at a financial firm that wound up being like four blocks from that Shrek firm I took. They basically gave her feedback that they didn't like the way I presented myself. I was very curvy at the time. So I took it to be my clothes may be too tight for you. Like, I think they had mentioned something about the pants. But the thing that really got to me, and I kind of expected that as a curvy Latina, like, like there's certain things we can't wear, but there's certain things of other ethnicities, but yet another race always gets to wear and it's not inappropriate, right? Like I would see it at work. It's like, we would always dress up a little more button up, but then you have girls who can get away with wearing basically mini skirts to work and nobody says anything and that's perfectly acceptable from them, right? So the pants comment, whatever, but the part that really got to me was that she said my hair was not kept enough. So the recruiter asked me to straighten my hair for my second interview with them. As you can see from, my hair is basically dead straight. And that wasn't enough. So I understood that the undertone was, we just don't like her, ethnically her. There's stuff about her that bothers us. <laughs> but I was so in need for a job that I didn't care but I remember that morning straightening my hair which I hate the smell to begin with it's something I avoid just like feeling choked up and being like this sucks and then like brushing those thoughts away and being like but I have to do this I can't feel late and like, this matters and I need this job and what is it and even if this isn't it I have to show the recruiter I'm trying I don't want this job at this point but I have to show the recruiter I'm trying so I have to comply because they're going to give her feedback but I remember praying the whole time, like, I don't want to get this. I just don't want to burn a bridge with this recruiter. But if this is how they see me, they have a problem with my pants, they have a problem with my hair, and the whole staff is white, I know the problem isn't with how I'm presenting myself. The problem is something I can't control. Did you tell anybody about some of those early experiences? I told a few coworkers after the trauma started passing, this was before, yeah, when I started telling people, it was way after the job. Like, I didn't process it. I think I might have told a few people in my inner circle, but I didn't process the damage of it until months later when I started. So when I got in this new job, they had never seen me with my hair down, and I didn't think they would care because all my interviews, I guess, from that prior conversation, I went in a bun, which I guess I subconsciously had done. After that other interview, I went in a bun to all my interviews. They had no idea how long my hair was. And frankly, I don't think they would have cared because that's why I chose them. Out of every team, every office I interviewed with, they were the most diverse. They were the most authentic looking. Like they wore loud necklaces. Their hair wasn't flat iron. Their hair was natural. It was just you could tell everyone wasn't in what I call a corporate suit, like faking themselves. So that's why I had chosen them. But that thing had permeated into my brain so hard that I wound up cutting my hair 
like shoulder length. And obviously I know that people can't see it, but like my hair is like past my hips and it has been that way most of my life because in my culture, it's like a really big deal to have like long hair, like in our particular nationality. So like also for me, I bear resemblance to my grandmother. So it was like an emotional thing, especially after she passed for me and my dad. So like for me to always keep my hair long, natural, healthy hair, and I chopped it all off. Because I was just like, well, yeah, I can loosen up my clothes a bit, quote unquote, by bigger clothes if my curves are a problem. But what if I have my hair done and it's blending in the wrong spot and, and calling the wrong attention? And what if they're going to judge me? What if they're going to think less of me? You know, because Latinas have this narrative of like being seductive or being this or being that. And I don't want them to assume anything bad about me. And I don't want them saying I'm branding the firm wrong. And I, it was just like all of these anxious thoughts that I was like, well, there's one quick way to resolve this. I cut my hair and I didn't make it conscious. I was like, oh no, I can let myself just like I did straighten my hair that other day. I was like, it's just, I'm getting older and this is more professional. And like, as if there's anything wrong with my hair, I get compliments for it all the time for keeping it long. But in my head, I was like, well, no, I'm getting older. And like, this isn't another phase. And like, I should cut my hair shoulder length. And it's fine. I'm just trying to show up in a new way. It took two or three months for me to begin hating my hair and hating how I looked because I didn't feel like myself. And it wasn't until then that I realized I had made this decision to be acceptable or presentable or professional looking. And that I never made this decision for myself. I made this decision entirely out of fear, entirely to please some boogeyman that I couldn't see. I think we often do those things to avoid all of the things we talk about, right? Like we do it to avoid the microaggressions, the racism, the sexism, the the cultural bias, all of these things. I even have a friend like very similar. I went to school with him and he said literally first day of orientation, he walked in with braids. Mm -hmm. He went to orientation the first day, texted his barber, made an appointment and cut off his braids. That <sighs> first day, I mean, talk about like he hasn't taken classes. He hasn't even thought about what internship he wants to do. He literally just looked around and was like, oh, this is going to be tough. Yeah. And just did that. But I think, at least from my experience, that like we do so much, whether it's aesthetically or start expanding our interests into things that we know we don't like, but we just do it because we're trying to fit in. But I think eventually we realize like, yo, none of that really matters. They still have a certain perception of us. Do you think it helped your career? No, not at all, because I think it robbed me of being authentic in any small way because the coworker that I eventually told of the story, and I remember I did tell people openly at first when I joined, because to make matters worse in a certain way, a few days after I got hired at this company that I got, chose to go with at the Shrek firm, the hair loss got passed in New York. So it was, oh, so two weeks ago, I was being told that I had to straighten my hair for an interview. And now it's illegal to make any such comments and assumptions, the irony. And now here I am with my hair cut off. And so I think like, that's also probably why I prolonged digesting it, right? But that coworker afterwards, we became friends. And one of the things she had said to me as I kept pushing hard up against many hills, trying to progress my career at that firm, she said to me, it's nice to finally see you taking up space. And the more we got closer, the more she kind of felt comfortable digging into that. And she was like, at first, we kind of had a bit of concerns, like if you would ever feel confident in the role, because it felt like you kind of shrunk in your chair. But at that time, I was pretty thicker for me to shrink in a chair. Like there was no space for me to really shrink in the chair. But she said it was, if you know, just being honest, I'm being really honest, like it was pretty heavy. And so for her to say that, I was like, but it's the energy I was giving right? She didn't know the thoughts in my head. She didn't know how small I felt. She didn't know how uncomfortable I felt, how distrusting I felt of things. And I think it kind of, thinking about our conversation, I realized it also blended into other things. I told her after the fact, like there's so many things like, and she would, I remember I told her the story of everything that really happened the first few months to me, like behind the curtain. She was like, it is crazy. She was like, because yes, you didn't take up space. She's like, but in your shoes, she goes, I don't think I would have made it. I had a consultant who, whenever we were alone, would say things to me like, well, do you think you're good enough to replace someone who's been here 25 years, but you're beloved by everyone else and you're nice to the admin team. So like, heavens forbid, I say, oh yeah, I think he's kind of a bully. 
or a coworker who I think it's probably the first time my boss was like, ah, that's who I really hired. I stood up to him privately because he was making inappropriate comments to me. But I was like, I don't want to rock the boat. So I'm just going to stay quiet and take it. Like what? It was like, think, oh, I really like your sweater. Or but it was like inappropriate comments that you don't say to someone who you work with. Inappropriate comments like we had gone to a holiday party and I guess to him that made him feel like he knew me in a different way. And he just, it was something that I couldn't really explain to words. But even then it was like another co-worker who saw it because again, he would try to do it mostly when we were alone and when the rest of our team wasn't there because we were on the same team. It was kind of like indirect trying to see if like he could make a pass at me and if I would like reciprocate. And it wasn't until another co-worker finally saw it that she was like, oh yeah, I've noticed. She was like, and I've noticed it multiple times. And I'm like, oh, so I'm not crazy. It's like one I'm of not- those things, what do they say? Like, you, you don't remember what they said, but you always remember how they made you feel. But it's important, what you said right now is so important, because I think we often go through certain situations. And if there's not another witness there, like, we literally feel like we're crazy. We're like, Did, yeah. no, I'm, nah, I'm bugging out. Like, he was just being nice. Damn, was he, was he crossing the line? And if it wasn't for that coworker, I think I would have kept letting it slide because I was like, I don't want to rock the boat. I'm only into this job, like what, two or three months. I don't want to like, and then the other reason that in my head, I also couldn't stomach it. He was also in my head. I was like, I don't want to put him in trouble. I don't want to call him out. I don't want to go to my supervisors. I don't want to make things uncomfortable. The only reason our boss found out was because I guess something in me took over and I guess I went on him so hard but even then I did it in a private conference room where no one could hear us no one could see us he wound up going to my boss asking if he was going to get fired I guess kind of preempting himself thinking I was going to go to her next and that is the only reason she even found out and when we wound up speaking afterwards she was like I'm happy you stood up for yourself she was like I don't have to be there to know you did the right thing he wound up eventually leaving but if it had not been for that co-worker being like you're not crazy I don't think I've ever would have stood up to him. That is so deep. Like you're almost putting his career ahead of yours in some ways. You're like, whoa, my potential is being limited because of the environment that I'm in. No, if I snitch on him, his potential is limited. And the fact the layer of like, you probably looked at him and was like, yo, word? I was like, you were acting like this to me? Bro, really? You're making me feel uncomfortable? It sucked. But then you know what it is? And I'm sure all the women can probably relate to me. At the, before I, what also put me on the edge or maybe made me more mad, I don't know which way it's weighed. At that holiday party, as all holiday parties and companies go, I found out about some sexual assault case that had happened prior to me joining. Oof. And that was, happens a lot, you think? I don't know. I think there's a lot of inappropriate relationships. I, I can't speak to assault. I don't know. I, at least I'm sure. I ever confided in me, shared anything. I do think yeah, there are yeah. relationships because when you spend more time at work than you're doing seeing your own family or traveling for work, I'm guessing inappropriate bonds are formed no matter what, right? I'm not saying I'm agreeing with that, but... I was working at a tech company. It wasn't a holiday party, but it was like an after event. So we had the event or the conference. And then after the internal conference, like a bunch of us went to this bar and I had this dude, he was like, oh, what's your name? I was like, oh, Pavel. He's like, oh my God, like that's my favorite porn star's name. I was like, I'm so... I'm sorry, excuse me, what? I'm like, I'm gonna go get another drink just to like make an excuse to step away. I'm like, that was weird. I didn't tell anybody, whatever. So I'm in this conversation with somebody else. Had my back towards turned him later in the night, grabs my ass. Yeah. What's crazy is that like, whoa, this is my dream job. I don't even know if I'm a snitch on him. I'm not gonna do anything, but someone else saw it. And because they were a manager, they sort of, I don't know if it's like the manager code of conduct. They were like, as a manager, I have to report it. I saw it. They're like, yeah. did, that, did that just happen? Or did I just see, they were like, I was like, no, it happened. He reported it. The, the employee ended up getting fired. Went through this whole like internal investigation. But it's this interesting thing of like, I don't know if I would have snitched on him. I don't know. Like it was one of those situations where like one, someone else was there and was like, even in that poor star comment, somebody was like, that was weird. I was like, did I, is that weird? Someone else made me feel like I wasn't crazy, but also- I don't know if I would have snitched on him if the manager wasn't there. Honestly, one first, I'm sorry you went through that. That is horrible. And I'm happy that manager saw it. Because what I was going to say is, as women, 
you kind of learn some sad truths early on. And I knew that if I spoke up, having no tenure at the company, having no credibility, having no high role, am I ending my career before I ever even leave an admin role? Am I ending myself in an industry? And to make matters worse, my boss had already defended me from to no fault of my own. And this is again, when I say like I went through some crazy stuff in interviewing and that's how bad I wanted a job. The security guard at this firm, it was a shared building. So technically, I don't even think it was their hire, right? Had tried to make a pass on me right before my interview. Like hiring me making comments, like I'm sorry, making comments about my ID photo and things like that. And then being like, oh, you can tell your boyfriend I don't mind sharing, blah, 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 blah. And like, I had to brush it off because I had to go to this interview. I had to go upstairs to 30 something floors and be like, that didn't just happen. Like, game face, game face, don't think about it. And so he had done it more than once. And I remember like after I got the role, I came like a month later, we were having friendly conversations and I mentioned it, I wasn't expecting anything. But being a mostly female team, they got so furious and they contacted his boss and they were like, you realize he could have totally messed up this hire for us. This is completely unacceptable. He needs to go through some training. Like he did this to our employee. Do you know what he could potentially be doing to our clients as well? Like, do you realize this is so horrible for us to find out? I think they gave him a, like a suspension for like two weeks or so. I didn't see him for a bit. And I had a friend who worked with him. So I kind of knew a bit that he did get quote unquote reprimanded. But they were unionized. He wasn't really going to go nowhere. So it's like having the context of that, having the context that I'm a woman, that I've barely been here long. Am I really going to go be like, hey, boss, so another incident of uncomfortable situations is happening? Never. Because I was like, I'm going to be like the kid that keeps crying wolf. I either have to stand up for myself and try to set a firm line or suck it up. And hearing his remarks with other coworkers about Mind you, he joined like a month after me, but hearing the remarks about that sexual assault case and stuff and being like, oh, well, at least she got a nice payout. So good for her. And I'm like, girl is probably in her mid twenties. It's probably signed an NDA. No amount of payout could take back the lack of fulfillment and the fact that she's been probably blacklisted at multiple firms because being blacklisted from a Shrek firm, it would have to take a very brief small boutique firm to take a shot at you after all of that. So the fact that he was comfortable saying that and being like, oh yeah, but at least she's got a payout, so she'd be fine. Like, okay. A payout, money can only do so much. What about her earning potential? What about her family? Like nothing about her. And in your mind, the payout is fine. Like she'll be fine. She doesn't need anything else. And I think it's that just, pushed me to be like, I'm gonna stand up to him at least privately. It's just interesting yet like sad internal conversation that i think many of us have to have around like like what's my quota on mm -hmm. telling on people or like reporting people that's kind of like what you're alluding to you were like all right well i did it once maybe i have three for the year <laughs> is <laughs> like oh you're right it, you're right you're absolutely right so the other thing in the background happening right there's my coworker making me uncomfortable there's a security guy that's making me uncomfortable there's this hair trauma there's that consultant that's like making offhanded comments that no one knows about of why i'm feeling small let's add layer number five i being part of the admin team one of us closed the office one of us opened it i was the closer in that i would see the cleaning team and like Again, treat everyone with the same respect from the CEO all the way to the cleaning staff. And I had gone to a mostly white university, at least initially before I transferred outside of the city. And I remember a very particular dynamics between like the Sodexo people and like even smaller campuses have like Einstein's or coffee or whatever, like even the small spots, they wouldn't really engage with you outside of their role. Like I would try to say like, good morning. And I could sense fear. I never sensed disrespect. I sensed fear. And within time, they admitted it. And so I had to start talking to them in Spanish and be like, buenos dias, buenas tardes. And they were like, oh, she's one of us. We can talk to her. But there was this fear around them. And I started picking up that the vibe was similar from the cleaning staff in the office. And in my mind, I couldn't wrap around it because my media team was nice. I knew they had mentioned they had tensions from the cleaning staff, which just like security was hired by building services, had nothing to do with them. But eventually, I wore down one of the ladies within the first month. Because something in my spirit said something isn't right here. It might you'll get the answer. I ended up befriending her by being late one day, like staying later than I should have. So I saw her come in, throw her food and stuff. And 
she was like, oh, we're from the same city. And that's how kind of how I began wearing her down. I'm like, yeah, we're from the same city. And my mom's like, yes. Oh my God, was the last time you went? Slowly wore her down. And she, one day finally came up to me. She was like, like, she like gave me the whole tea. And she was like, is that lady on your team gone who used to sit in X spot? And I was like, yeah, she left a week after me. She was supposed to be my supervisor. Part of the reason I also felt comfortable in team initially. Left a week after I joined. Did not know the blessing in disguise of that was. She was like, okay, good. And then she eventually began saying, she's really mean to us. And I was like, what do you mean? Explain this to me. Like, she's really mean to us. She was like, and I don't understand it. She was like, and I think some other of your team members, like, and she meant like the larger office, picked up on it because I had someone like directly ask me, like, you're being told not to talk to us, right? And she was like, and that's basically said, like, like, don't engage with anybody, even if they engage with you. Like, she treated them, like, less than. And she was like, and she literally said to me, she was like, and I don't understand because your CEO is always so nice to me. He's so nice to us. And, like, he's always so polite with us. But she always tells us, like, don't talk to you guys. Like, unless we're engaged and even then keep it minimal or we try to ignore when possible. Like, basically be seen but not heard. And so I'm learning all these crazy dynamics in the background. And like, it's like, there's so many things going on and it's like, cool. Well, now I have to try to, for everyone's happiness, better these relationships with these cleaning staffs that are absolutely terrified of my immediate team, which are full of really nice people. Because another person thought it was okay to make them feel little. Then she started telling me all these things of the bad ways they would treat them and She'd be like, she would watch footage of us after hours to like find things to nitpick to us about, like literally sit in one of the conference rooms and drink wine with her supervisor at the time. Thankfully, not mine, not my boss at the time. She was like, and just, it felt like she got a rise out of mistreating us. She told me that their boss, which was no saying of their own, went as far as to throw them a pizza party once I had confirmed she was actually gone. As a (laughs) celebration. A celebration that she was gone. That's wild and it's crazy because all of this is happening and it's not like you're not also trying to just like advance in your career you're just trying to get into the office let alone do your work right i want to touch on two things that you mentioned that i think are 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 really important Mm -hmm. you keep mentioning shrek firms what the hell is that how do you spell that shrek like the movie character yeah, like the movie character. So Strike is the self-chosen nickname by the top five executive firms. I'm going to butcher the names, but it's basically each letter. It's an acronym. So Spencer Stewart, Hydrick and Struggles, Russell Reynolds, what's e? Egon Zeltner, and then Shrek K, Corn Fairy. So it's kind of their self-proclaimed nickname. But if you look at ratings and executive search for eons and eons, they have remained the top five for a long time. Even if they move in ranking, it's kind of like a, I kind of hate to say it. I hate this comparison and, and no shade to any wonderful Ivy grads, but I guess in a way they consider self, themselves the Ivies of extract firms. It's kind of like they're the top echelon. Like you, you made it here, you stay within the circle. Like don't move out of the circle kind of thing. Interesting. So you also mentioned like within these Shrek firms, potentially here you are experiencing some of these microaggressions and unfortunate situations and circumstances. But there's even a reference to like, here are these five powerful organizations and colluding is legal, yeah, right? But this idea of like even getting blacklisted and not working for these five companies, like you think that's a thing? I think it's very much possible. I think as much as they compete with each other, wow, I think the Ivy analogy is probably perfect. I can't imagine Ivy's ever not associating with Ivy's, right? I'm pretty sure as much as they compete with each other, I also know for a fact that they have meetings to kind of share best practices or kind of stay applicable to a certain degree. Because here's the thing, you don't leave this level. Once you're at this level, you try to stay at this level. So if you leave Corn Fairy, you try to go to Hydric and Struggles. If you leave Hydric and Struggles, then at best you try to go to Spencer Stewart. If you leave Spencer Stewart, you start to go to Egon. If you leave Egon, you try to go to Russell Reynolds. They try to stay within the same circles. So I almost find it really hard to imagine, right? And this is maybe me stretching because I don't have details and I'm obviously not going to ask for them. I thought it was disgusting that they were so openly speaking about something so painful for her. But I can't help but imagine that if she had an issue with someone at this particular Shrek firm, that person had not previously worked at least two other Shrek firms and shared that with someone who might have shared that with someone else. 
I mean, it's a small industry, right? I mean, even within tech, like you leave Facebook, you go to Google, you go to Google, then you go to Apple, you go to Apple, then you go to Netflix. You're like, like in circle, circle, circle. Yeah. So it's impossible that people don't know each other. It just, it doesn't, in my mind, I don't think it's possible. I think she probably went to a different industry, maybe, but I can't imagine that she stayed within the same industry because no matter how much you may like something, to be seen a certain way, like a liability for no fault of your own. I can't imagine. It's fascinating to this field of executive search, which is kind of similar, but very different from just like recruiting as a job function overall. And here you are experiencing certain biases, right? From like a personal individual level, but here you are potentially seeing a lot of biases from even your assignments. So at this particular firm, I did not get to touch that kind of work yet. I'm happy to touch about it at my current firm. And at my current firm, I'm very fortunate. We, if anything, we have the opposite problem because we represent a lot of multiracial works, at least in my particular Rolodex of work. So if anything, if, if you're not a POC, we're probably not going to hire you for the role because we don't think you have a personal understanding of what this organization is about. And if you have any true, I guess, ally ethical thoughts, then you realize it's also probably inappropriate of us to hire you to begin with. But there are also other people who are now obsessed with having a person of color kind of like setting them up to fail and not realizing it because they want a person of color so badly at a seat of power that I sometimes kind of want to scream and be like, do you realize the improbability of you finding a person of color in a very niched context that meant that they would have had to already be a person of affluence to work for a sector, the sector I currently work with is nonprofit. And it makes me want to scream at clients sometimes because I see them villainize white candidates. And they're like, and these could be white people as well, being like, oh, she probably has a white savior complex. I'm like, excuse you? But were you the one speaking to the candidate? Like, how did you jump from one thing on their resume to say they have a white savior complex? And also to have had an entire nonprofit career, in my opinion, or any person of color, they had to have either a lot of bravery, tenacity. I don't even know what the word is here, but nonprofit pays unless you're starting at the C-suite level because you're a donor and you're a funder and you clearly have that money. So then wanting people of color who have a long nonprofit career and just are ready to go to me is absolutely ridiculous because choosing a nonprofit career, which I came to realize, which is how I initially founded a strike firm, is often a choice of privilege because you have the money to backfill what your nonprofit job is not paying you. I remember when I came out of school, the reason I was so depressed was because some of these roles were like, yeah, we're going to be like 33000 a year. And I'm like, I'm eating ramen for every day of my life that I'm working for you. Like, is this it? Is this what we're talking? And no, and no shade to ramen, but I'm like, I don't know what you want me to do here. Like two bros pizza, one dollar slice every day. Like, is that what we're talking about? $33,000? Like that pass on what I paid for a year of college. Like, I don't understand. And so <laughs> I see the reverse. But to your point, back at the Shrek firms, which we can also talk about bias. I mean, I'm being able to advance and why I have to leave. I would mm. constantly call them out in their own bias in hiring because that firm that I kind of shared that story about when I say I pray them in is because they didn't realize they had inherent bias and maybe it's not malicious, but if your impact ends up being negative, then you need to assess that. They would only hire white researchers. So people mining LinkedIn were all white. They were all from the same schools, from the same economic classes. And then you're wondering why you're not finding diverse candidates, why you're not finding these candidates that your clients want, why you're hiring the same people over and over. Well, if the same people internally you're hiring for the job, think the same way, went to the same schools, go to the same country clubs. Well, gee, no wonder they're finding the same kind of candidates over and over. I remember I would walk around grunting all the time, researcher so white. <sighs> because I just not stand how blind they were. I'm like in New York City. You're telling me in New York City, you never thought, hey, let me at least roll on over to NYU and just like talk to their careers person. They literally would reach out. And I generally believe these were not bad people because when I raise these concerns, they acknowledge them to some degree. And I, I see the effort now, right? Even after I've left, they're hiring more researchers of color. But 
they would literally go to their alumni networks. They would literally go to their own universities and be like, oh, hey, we're looking for interns. And usually those interns would get the job and the cycle would continue. And then we'd have more white consultants and more white consultants. And then one year where we had diversity issues throughout the company. There comes an interesting point where you become comfortable being a little bit more authentic or speaking up for yourself. Was it a specific moment? Like when did you start feeling more comfortable doing that? That took a long time. I think I had to get very mad before I ever got comfortable. I had began trying to advance within the company a little bit after lockdown, mostly because we had so much downtime that we were outsourced to other teams. And I was like, well, this is perfect. I have downtime. I want to do other things. Let me outsource myself. Let me grow. My boss, lover, we still keep in touch with the state my boss at the time. She always told me, like into my face, I knew when I hired you, I wouldn't have you for long. I knew that you were going to do something bigger at this firm or bigger outside of this firm. And I knew you probably weren't going to be here longer than a year. And when I kept getting door to door close to my face, I remember her saying, it pains me because you never should have been in this role this long. And this is a white woman, mind you. And so she would let me outsource myself to other teams. And time after time, no matter what work I did, no matter what overtime I did, clocked or not clocked that, no matter what level I worked with, it wasn't enough. I got promised that jobs would be open, that I had to wait, that it would happen. And I knew the day I officially lost my ish, it was, I think, one July, I kind of sent an email to the head of the team that had been desperately trying to join. He basically was like, I think the roles that are open are somewhat beneath you because you've been working people from higher levels, which the people that have been working with that I trusted all said to me, they were like, don't take crap. Take, you deserve a higher level and you deserve to stay in New York because at that time, people starting in that team had to relocate to a whole other city in Texas. And that was their new pilot program. And then start again from there. My salary wouldn't be cut, but I'd be put away from my family. We're still in lockdown. This isn't fair. I would be put with a bunch of college kids. And I've been working at this company for a few years. I know the systems. Why are you making me start from ground zero? When I pushed back in a prior email, he had said, well, actually, on second thought, it's kind of good for us because you do know the company and you do know the systems. So it kind of works for our favor that there would be someone there who understands the company better. So it works in your favor for me to take a lesser job. And I wrote him back this email afterwards being like, so what job, right? Because you said this job isn't right for me, would be worth it. Because now I've been turning down other jobs in the company that I don't want. And at this point, I'm losing more than 10, 15 Gs and saying no to these jobs. I'm losing my credibility. I'm losing my name. I'm losing the trust of people in my own office because I keep deferring different jobs that I technically don't want. To hold up for a job, you keep promising me that clearly is never coming. He never replied. And that is when I knew I had lost it. The fact that I sent them an email that was like five paragraphs because I was like, if one day I leave, the day I do my exit interview, I want there to be proof that I tried so freaking hard and all I got was played time after time. So I think it took a lot of becoming angry for me to become more of myself. And then honestly, it took bumping into other bad people. Again, another person who also kind of had wanted me for their team who I found out another person of color who isn't the best of people of color. And thankfully I got the intel prior to saying yes to their job offer, but that also made my life harder at work because I had also someone playing against me who was at a higher level. So again, it took a lot of bad experiences for me to kind of start owning my voice and being like, I'm done taking crap and I'm done putting up with it. And yeah. When you think about being yourself though, and you even alluded to the word authenticity, what does that mean? When you hear that word, it's such a buzzword. Like, what does that word mean to you when you hear it? I think I thought a lot about this because every time I hear this in a podcast, I'm always like, oh, that's good. But I think for me, I think freedom. But I think a bigger one is safety. I think peace. And the other thing that comes to me is like, it's being known. I think it's being known, like, where your values are at, where your head is at, truly being known, and I guess accepted. Part of the reason, in conjunction with all these bad experiences, I found the courage was because I saw that consultant, who now is like a mentor to me, she wouldn't hide her personality, her happy, joyful personality for anybody. And me seeing that, I was like, oh, it's okay. It's okay for me to talk at an international firm and seeing her feel safe to be herself. I think that made me more safe to feel like, okay, I can begin being more of myself too. 
how does that feel though? Like when you first started like unraveling some of those layers, unlearning what you've been taught about professionalism, even in this new job, it sounds like you feel a little bit safer. It sounds like, I mean, I even see your hair. It's not at your shoulders. Like <laughs> how do some of these things feel right now? Weird. I wish I could tell you it feels good and I'm sure it will at some point. But I realized, and even got kind of called out on it on a review, that I still have a lot of trauma from the prior place. That like second guess everyone's comments, I second guess people's intentions, I second guess feedback, I second guess everything because I'm so scared of having a bug pulled out from under my feet again. I'm so scared of someone being nice to my face, but secretly in the background at an upper level gunning for me to fail, which seems so petty, but it happened in my prior firm, right? Someone who's a leader of a whole practice got mad that I turned her down and intentionally and unintentionally blocked me from moving forward. So scared, scared that I ain't upset the wrong person. It's like, yes, I feel safer, but I catch myself double guessing, double checking things, doubting, doubting people's goodness as bad as it sounds because I am so uncertain sometimes. So it's slowly happening and it's taken a lot longer than I'd like, but every now and then I have to stop myself and say, is this place or am I taking situations from my prior experience and bringing it into this new job? Did this person actually do say or mean X, Y, Z? Or is my body going into some weird like PTSD, like my, my brain is in a whole other two years ago kind of thing. I'm so glad that you kept it real on that answer. <laughs> you said it, you were like, I want to say that I feel great and happy and everything, <laughs> but if I'm real, yo, this feels weird. I don't even know if I'm doing it right. I don't, I don't. Like I want to give a really positive and happy answer, but it's, I know it's going to take time and it's hard. It's, it wasn't until yesterday that I have a wonderful supervisor now, a consultant who is a woman of color and another coworker. And I, we have like a little huddle, right? Like, cause we both started and I was telling him, I was like, bro, like I could not be doing it if it wasn't because my supervisor is a woman of color and because she's open about her bad experiences here. She's open about like, as you go up, this is what you're looking for. When a higher up tells you, this is what you're looking for. Don't be played, don't be game. This is what's coming. Cause she went through some really bad stuff at this place. And so she's always very candid about it. And she's really good about standing up for herself and clients internally. Yesterday, knowing that she's like going, right? She was like, hey, so the big box was X, Y, and Z. So I pulled her to the side and I was like, hey, can we stand for five minutes solo? And she was like, no, don't be worried. I don't think it's like a, she's looking to fire. you. She was like, I think she's assessing long-term value. And then she was like being very candid conversation. Like, this is where I think our boss's brain is at. And at the end of the conversation, when she was like, I have faith in you. And like, I want you to do well. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my God, I didn't read her wrong. Like, I guess I'm like, yay, yeah, like, great. She likes me, but I'm also like, oh my God, I didn't read her wrong because my brain is so like, you can't even trust women of color because it's happened in me at prior places. So my brain was like, oh my God, I didn't read her wrong. Like, yay. I think like that was my, yes, I was happy she said that, but in my brain, I was like, oof, okay, I'm not totally off here. <laughs> it's almost like you need just as many positive instances to like erase all of the negative ones that you went through. Yeah, and I don't I mean not to be dark, but I'm sure it'll come. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure how long that's going to take either because I'm aware I'm in an industry that's predominantly white. I'm in an yeah. industry where, yeah, there are a lot of women, but being a woman and being a woman of color are two different things, very different things. <laughs> and while there are some women of color consultants who made it to the top, again, like that supervisor that thankfully never became my supervisor, I read this quote love TikTok and he literally was like not all skin folk are kin folk and I was like yes so she proved that and like even now there's so many DIA issues at the firm I'm at that I'm like this is the worst time to come in here I feel so unwelcome to learn from track firms we're happier and brighter externally but you know burn them internally internally we can't give a damn so it's weird it's like yes I need more positive instances but I feel like it's also going to take a very particular context to speed up how quickly I can even get there. It seems to be like you're in a, in a better place, although there's a lot more room. As you look forward, though, like what's the one thing that continues to 
inspire you or empower you to continue being your most authentic self in these work environments? When people tell me I inspire them, when people tell me like seeing you do X, Y, and Z helps me believe I can or gives me the courage to speak up or makes me feel safer. And then people be like, because of you, I went for a different job. Because of you, I asked for things even if I didn't get it. Because of you, I had the idea to create a whole new role for myself. There's so many different roles and opportunities that came for other people who I did open up to, who I did start like mini support groups, I guess so to say, like, like little book clubs. And from there, just things went great for them. That, that helps because I think of my own situation with that manager, right? It's like kind of as you feel free, you automatically liberate others. And so that mentor, right, watching her be herself, I know that's also liberating others. Literally my screensaver is I message on LinkedIn from someone who was like, hey, I want you to know like all those little career chats you gave me, like you inspire me, thank you. And that's literally like my wallpaper on my phone. So those are the things that I'm like, okay, if nothing else, if it's a bumpy road, it's helping other people and that, that makes it worth it. Mi gente, that wraps up this week's episode of the Can't Do It Is podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, please do us a favor. Like, share, comment, wherever you're listening, please leave a rating and review. This just helps ensure that these experiences get heard by as many people as possible. And that's the only way that we're going to redefine professionalism. Thank you. See you next time.